this is Mr. Coates, and this is Apes Lecture number 16 on aquatic ecosystems, the saltwater side of things. I'm pretty partial to salt water. Uh, I grew up wanting to be a marine biologist, and uh, I always wanted to be near the ocean, and that's why I moved to Florida. And the saltwater ecosystems have always intrigued me, especially the tropical ones around coral reefs. And uh, so I spent a lot of time working with corals in my past life as a biologist at a local aquarium here in Tampa. The saltwater ecosystems are very interesting to me. Now the first type of saltwater ecosystem I want to talk about is a transitional system. A transitional system comes from the fresh water and then goes into saltwater and these are called estuaries. And estuaries uh, can be tropical or they can be temperate. If you have a tropical estuary like we do here in Tampa Bay, you have mangroves. This is a mangrove. This is a red mangrove down here, and you know that because of these prop roots here. These prop roots help uh, organism stay up out of the water, also help exchange gases, and it provides all kinds of habitat for all kinds of fish and crabs and other organisms that might be found there. Very important aquatic ecosystem, but only found in tropical estuaries. Once you get north of Tampa Bay, the mangroves kind of disappear, and so it's too cold up there for them. And so they're only a tropical species. Now the other type of estuary is a temperate estuary, and that's usually a salt marsh estuary where you've got lots of emergent grasses that come up out of the water in the shallow spots. Now both estuaries are have high nutrients, lots of nitrogen and phosphorus in these estuaries. They're highly productive. There's a lot of net primary productivity and there's a lot of life in these areas. They're the second most diverse aquatic ecosystem on the planet. One of the other important things about them is that they are all tidal. They are all influenced by the rising and falling of the oceans due to the gravitational pull of the moon. And so you get these zones based on tides. You look at this picture up here, we have barnacles that cover these pilings. Barnacles are a classic intertidal uh, estuarine organism. They can handle periodic drying, they can handle uh, fast temperature changes, they can handle different salinities. And uh, so you often see those at the top of pilings in these areas. Now underneath them is the oyster zone. And these are the oysters down here. And oysters, they like to be a little bit more wet, but they can also be uh, uncovered by the lowest tides when those occur. Now saltwater ecosystems are zoned very similar to those of freshwater ecosystems. So we're gonna take a look and look at these different zones. So the first zone we're looking at is this zone here. This is between high tide and low tide, tide and it's the intertidal. This is a highly fluctuating zone. Uh, the animals that live here have to uh, withstand periodic drying, periodic wetting. They can withstand severe temperature change. For example, the water might be 70 degrees and the air temperature may be 40. And when the tide goes out, then they have to withstand that 40 uh, degree temperature. So that's a 30 degree temperature change and not a lot of organisms can handle that fast change uh, in the aquatic ecosystems. Now once we get past low tide and out to the continental shelf, this is the coastal zone. Now the coastal zone is usually where we do most of our recreation, where we do a lot of our fishing, and uh, it's where it's mostly affected by man. So we'll look at the coastal zone here a little bit later and at the separate coastal ecosystems that are out there. Once we get past the coastal zone, we're in the pelagic zone. Okay, pelagic zone. The pelagic zone is the open ocean, and the pelagic zone actually includes all of the water in the open ocean area down to the very abyss. And so uh, most of the ocean is actually in the pelagic zone. Now, just like we had in lakes, we have a photic zone at the top where photosynthesis can occur. And when we get below that, then we have the aphotic. Now the deep ocean, instead of having a profundal zone like lakes, instead it has the abyssal zone. And the abyssal zone is the deepest part of the ocean. Uh, it can be divided up into several zones, but you don't have to know those for this course. The last zone I want to talk about, and it's the same in saltwater as it is freshwater, is the um, benthic zone. And the benthic zone is this entire bottom area, no matter how deep or how shallow. So if you are attached to the bottom or you are highly adapted to life on the bottom, you are a benthic organism, also known as benthos. Now, as I said before, the most important saltwater ecosystems are the coastal ecosystems. Those are the ones that we live nearest. It's the ones that we uh, 
take our boats out on, it's the ones we fish in, it's the ones where we get most of our aquatic food from. So these are the most important ecosystems we're talking about influences on, by man. So the first one we're talking about is the rocky shore. Rocky shore ecosystems are where the ocean actually meets uh, exposed rocks. And we don't see that too much here in Florida, but if you go to Maine or you go out to California, you'll see rocky shore ecosystems out there. Now, one of the characteristics of a rocky shore ecosystem is that there's a lot of wave energy in these ecosystems. Organisms that live in these rocks, they have to withstand the pounding of the waves. They have to be able to hang on or get under those rocks and take cover when those waves start coming in, or else they're just going to be bashed to death by the waves. Also, just like the estuarine ecosystem, it is also high, highly variable. It is within the intertidal zone, and so temperatures and uh, dryness and wetness can change very quickly. A lot of organisms sometimes get trapped in these tide pools, these little areas that get trapped in the rocks, these tide pools. And when uh, the sun is beating down, these, these things can heat up 30 to 40 degrees hotter than what the water was. And they won't cool down again until the tide comes back up. So the organisms that get trapped in these pools have to be able to withstand those temperature changes. Now, as I mentioned, coral reefs, the most diverse aquatic ecosystem in the world. And uh, that's because of where they grow. They all grow in the tropics. There is a lot of primary productivity is very high in coral reefs. And most of that is actually done by a symbiotic algae in the coral tissue. And it takes sun energy and gives it to the corals so the corals can grow. The corals then put down limestone, which is calcium carbonate. And the limestone actually builds the reef. So the corals are responsible for building the reef, and this is why the corals are the foundation species for all coral reefs. But within a cubic foot of coral reef, you can find over a thousand different organisms, and so they are highly diverse. However, they are also highly threatened. Corals are, draw thousands of people each year to them. They're in high pollution zones, they're in high traffic zones, and so coral reefs are getting damaged all the time by man's activities. Also, they're highly susceptible to climate change. Corals only like a certain temperature, and when the ocean warms up, they expel those zooxanthellae I told you about, and they can no longer get the energy from the sun, and then they end up dying, and this is called coral bleaching. Now, one of your favorite coastal ecosystems probably is the beach. You guys go to the beach quite a lot, and uh, you guys view this ecosystem all the time. But a sandy shore is very important to the coastal ecosystem. One of the most important things it does is that it prov provides a barrier against large storms. This is one of the problems with, uh, that happened with Hurricane Sandy. When Hurricane Sandy came ashore in New Jersey and New York, all of these beach ecosystems were built upon. So there are buildings there instead of these protective dunes that you see in this ecosystem. And in those areas where there was no protection by these dunes, we had lots and lots of damage to human uh, structures. Development on barrier islands or on sandy beaches is not a good idea because they are barriers to these storms. One of the things about them is that they constantly move, they constantly shift, so the sand is constantly moving back and forth on the beach. And then sometimes it erodes away and the water moves up, and then sometimes sand is put back in. So if you built a house out here, and the sand that roads away, then your house is going to fall into the water. It's not a good idea to build on barrier islands, but we do it all the time because of the dollar. The dollar always runs everything, and so these critical habitats are destroyed. We build hotels and resorts and houses on them, and then we end up spending billions of dollars out here to re-nourish and put the sand back because somebody else's house is there. And this is your tax dollars here at work. In my mind, that is a huge fleecing of your pocket because you are paying for this, uh, not the people that have their houses out here and not the people who have hotels out here. Now, when we get out in the open ocean, the ecosystems kind of drop off. There's not a whole lot of primary productivity out there. The only place you have primary productivity is at the surface where you get a lot of sunlight, and that's where the phytoplankton can grow. Phytoplankton are marine plants. They're microscopic. Now, there are a few places where you have floating ecosystems out in the middle of the, in the, middle of the ocean. One such place is here in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean called the Sargasso Sea. This is sargasm. It's a 
floating seaweed. It has these little gas bubbles that you see right here, and that allows it to float. And it collects in large floating masses out in the Sargasso Sea, which is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. This provides crucial habitat for a lot of organisms that are highly adapted to this weed. They look just like it. They're very well camouflaged. And also, a lot of baby sea turtles go out here and grow up. Other things that happen out in the middle of the ocean is that because of our use of plastic on the planet now, plastic floats, it does not degrade very well, and we're creating these large garbage patches out in the middle of our oceans where they collect in the gyres. That You see all this different kind of trash that's floating out in the middle of the ocean where no one lives or no one spends hardly any time. And we're starting to see larger mats all the time, especially in the Pacific. Uh, if you're more interested in this, look up Pacific Ocean, uh, Pacific Garbage Patch. The last saltwater ecosystem I want to talk about are the abyssal ecosystems. Now the abyssal ecosystems we have to remember are in the dark. They never get any light whatsoever, so very low primary productivity for the most part. In fact, most of the organisms that live in the abyss depend on this stuff right here. This is actually what we call marine snow. It's not snow though. It's actually the decaying and dead remains of organisms from the photic layer above the abyss that sink down very slowly to the bottom of the ocean. And so these provide energy for most of the abyssal ocean. Now one exception to that is where we find hydrothermal vents. Hydrothermal vents were discovered in the 1970s. This makes them a really, really recent discovery. And the interesting thing about them is that they are not based on solar energy. Up until the 1970s, we thought every ecosystem in the universe had to be based on solar energy because that was the only way we knew that energy came into the ecosystem. Well, with the discover of these hydrothermal vents, we found out that this whole ecosystem is based on the sulfur compounds that are spewing out of these events. So water seeps down to the earth, it warms up because of the mantle, it dissolves minerals like sulfur, and they get spewed out of these vents. Now this is very hot water, but around these vents you have these large clusters of bacteria. Also you see these large clusters of worms out here. These worms have these bacteria in their tissues as symbionts. These bacteria are very important because they eat this sulfur and convert it into uh, useful energy for the rest of the ecosystem. The entire ecosystem is built not on plants but on bacteria. And when we discovered these in the 1970s it totally changed the way we looked at life. From then on we've been looking at planets that have liquid water on them and may have these type of ecosystems underneath ice caps or within deeper oceans. And so this like I said, really changed the way we look at life. Since then we have found other uh, uh, deep water ecosystems that don't depend on, depend on light but depend on methane as well. CH4 is methane. Well that's the last aquatic ecosystem that you have to learn about. I hope these were helpful in helping you understand the difference between the different ecosystems. Make sure you learn all of those zones. Those are important and the characteristics that go along with them.